her personal life, how she's been juggling politics and being a mother and a lot of other things as well. And moving forward, what really is the plan for the NDC ahead of December 7? Good morning, ma'am, and thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. I'm very well. Thanks you, for asking. I was asking you off air if you are not tired already. <laughs> I really want to ask you on TV as well because... <laughs> The concern would be that, you know, you've been running around the country, of course, campaigning, which is expected because of your position as the running mate. But how has the experience been like? It's been amazing. Mm. It's been rewarding. Um, it has been exciting. Mm. And anything in between those yeah. words. Are there any surprises? And I think that it's been a privileged um, experience for me to get first-hand experience of your of your own country mm. uh, because of life because of jobs and so on we may know a specific area yeah. a bit more deeply than others but this campaign you know has taken me everywhere and it has allowed me to have first-hand experience mm. of how we live yeah have there been surprises some in the sense that here we are in Accra we can complain that, oh, today there's no water. Mm. But then you get to places that they don't have water shortage. They've never had it. Mm. They've never had the electricity. They don't have the roads. The schools are not so close by. The hospitals are non-existent. Mm. And all of these, you know, inform your own prior knowledge. They expand your understanding. And I think they also allow you to refocus on what it is that should be done. Mm. Yeah. What should be done? What should be done is for us to think that the country includes people like that, who live that way every day, and it's not just once in a while, mm. who don't have doom so for a day or a year, or who've never had electricity, mm. you know. And that's difficult. Of course comprehend. it will be difficult. I mean, if you meet women, girls especially, going to fetch water, and you are driving, and you go a long distance before you see the water they are coming to fetch, mm. it should be a matter of concern to you. Yeah. Because you ask yourself, if these girls are in school, for example, and they have to do this every day, at what time are they getting to school? Mm. And therefore, if they are getting to school every day late, are you surprised that the results come and some of the girls are not doing so well? Mm. And then you know very well that it's not that they cannot do well, but because some challenges in their lives have not been removed. Mm. The same can be said for the women who are also fetching the water, the toll on their lives. You know, so many things that come to mind when you see scenes such as this. I mean, if you touch on girls and women, of course, we do understand that you are very concerned about the girl child and education for girls and women as well. Uh, you, you were in the education ministry for a number of years. Of course, you led the ministry. Does this then paint a clearer picture of why a lot of these girls, unfortunately, could not necessarily, you know, um, engage or get the opportunity to also enjoy all the benefits that everybody else was enjoying in education and women participation and all of that? Of course, the reasons are many. They're mm -hmm. very complex. But this is one of them. This is certainly one of them. Yes. And it's a matter of um, itemizing the reasons itemizing the challenges and finding lasting solutions mm. to removing those challenges so that life can also go on for them as it does for others. But more about you, I mean, as a mother, you're a mother to three beautiful children. Thank uh, you. We, we've read a bit about, you know, how successful they have been in terms of education and their work and all of that. How are you juggling all this and politics? This is interesting because I keep saying that as a human being, maybe man or woman, um, adding anything to your life is a challenge. Mm. And as a mother, because we have all these other responsibilities, sometimes it becomes even more challenging mm. than it normally would be for the other gender. So in my particular case, um, I think it's a matter of strategy. Mm. You know, I know what it is like to breastfeed the baby, <laughs> yeah. spoon feed another one, and mm -hmm. keep my eyes on my notes. Mm -hmm. Because I had all my three children when I was a full-time PhD student. Mm -hmm. So I really, really sympathize with the young people in similar situations. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying that one of the things that should happen is not so much mentorship, but as to share our experiences, to let them know this phase two will pass, mm -hmm. and to encourage them 
to prioritize some of the things that they do. Mm -hmm. Because you know the children will not, will not stop growing whilst you go and get a PhD. Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. And as the child psychologists also have impressed on us, the early years are the most critical for any person's life. Mm -hmm. So then you need to learn to balance your time in favor of these young children, knowing that they will grow up. What about young people? Because again, not just a mother to your kids, but a mother to the youth generally. You're called the mother, uh, you know, the queen of peace and patience and all of that. So there's a <laughs> lot that you have instilled in young people over the years as an academician. And of course, now as a politician, we're going to see a lot more of that. Your interaction with the youth, what are the nuances that you have identified with regards to their preparedness and interest in governance and leadership position and politics? If I, one of the things I've recognized is um, their waning hope. Mm. It's like their hope is waning. Mm. It's like they don't see themselves as part, of, as part of what is going on, and that is very dangerous. Wow. We need to let them feel included. We need to let them know there's hope, that situations can change, that they'll be included and respected. And I think that is why we did our manifesto the way we did it. Mm. When you say the youth, there's nothing like a monolithic group called the youth. They are youth of different categories, different needs, and you need to be very, very mindful in disaggregating these needs so that you are able to meet them. Mm. There's somebody who falls in the category of youth who's never been to school. It doesn't matter, but he's farming. Mm -hmm. What are his needs? There's someone who falls into the category of youth who is a young mother. What are her needs? There's somebody who falls into the category of youth who is in school or who's just started a family or who's just facing a new profession. You know, they have different needs. And therefore, you need to try to meet those needs mm. so that they'll feel there's somebody there for them and that there's also someone to whom they can go. You know, so workplace, essays, group dynamics, you know, all these are all conversations we should be having. With the young people? Yes. You know, with the women and the men too. Okay. Sometimes we forget the men also need support. Mm. So we need to embrace all of them. You know, it's not a matter of I'm going to solve your problem. No. But I'm going to show you that whatever you're going through is not unique. You can, you can overcome it. This is how X did it. Maybe you, you may want to learn something from it. Mm -hmm. Because the situations are never identical. So it's about listening to their voices. It's about supporting them. It's, it's about letting them feel they matter, you know, and that they are part of your plan. It's about giving them that kind of hope. Mm -hmm. And maybe coming from the campus, that has taught me a lot. Because all my life I've been around young people who sometimes feel that way. Mm -hmm. They are leaving the university, they are not too sure where they are going, what's in it for them. You get a few people to come and give them lectures about motivation, mm -hmm. and it's the end of it, which is good. I'm not saying the motivational talks are not important. But beyond that, you need to have a strategy too, you know, okay. and support them to also draw a plan. You know, I need to put this very, very carefully, <laughs> but what I want to say is that there's this scene of maybe a young couple that got married soon after they graduated. That's fine. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with it. Then they realize, no, we have to go to school. So mom is going to school, daddy is going to school. Baby comes, baby too needs somebody else. So perhaps they can sit and have a good strategy and order their priorities, you know? Okay. Order their priorities and go by them. Um, as I keep telling young, mom, young mothers or young fathers, Nobody is a baby forever. Yeah, you'll grow eventually. <laughs> but this is the time they need you. So in your own prioritization, you need to make certain concessions. And that's where the People's Manifesto comes in because you say it addresses the needs of these people. They have been concerns that, and not just the NDC, but the manifestos all through are more like shopping lists. And so they only address the immediate needs of people without really having a long-term plan for national well, I, development. I hope you have read our manifesto. I have. You but these are that. concerns. These are concerns from some citizens. Yes, they, they are genuine concerns. I'll not rubbish them. But all I'm saying is that our manifesto does not do that. And that is why I give the category of youth. 
each mm -hmm. with their own need. The person who is starting a family doesn't have the same need as a person who is doing something else mm -hmm. or who wants to go to law school, for example. That's also a member of the youth. She wants to study law. There's nothing wrong with it. Mm. But perhaps the structure that has been set up for a long time makes it very difficult for this person to get in. So what do you do? You look okay. at that problem and you see how you can, you can give opportunity for this person to learn the subject and, and to become a professional lawyer because you cannot say that you have too many or whatever the case. Yeah. You know, so that's what I mean by our manifesto targets individual or group problems mm. or group aspirations. And going on, going from there, you need to have your, even if it's a zero zero draft implementation plan, at least. some idea on how. Well, let's take a look at some of the promises that have been made, of course, in the manifesto. One of them will be the one million jobs agenda. And also that concern has been that. How is this going to be possible? What kind of jobs are we talking about? How are we going to create these jobs? It depends on our own understanding. If you look at a manifesto again, we have mm -hmm. the Minister of Agriculture and, and uh, Agribusiness. Mm -hmm. That's, that has a long chain of, of uh, possible jobs, from the seed to the table. Okay, let me just illustrate with my own, uh, I come from Commander. Mm. the holy city of Kovinda. And we had a sugar factory. It's, 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 it's just not functioning. Mm. But here is a factory that would, would employ farmers. Or farmers, they can grow their own sugar cane. So there'll be those who are planting, there'll be those who are tending, there'll be those who are harvesting, there'll be those who will be cutting the produce to the factory, there'll be the technical people, There'll be the machines, those who look after them. There'll be the whole process of turning that sugar cane into sugar. Into, yeah. There'll be those who will bag them. There'll be those who will transport them to the market. And be those of us who will purchase them. So on this line alone, you see the possible jobs mm. that you can create. Mm. So I'm just using that as one example. Okay. Are these Again, sustainable, by the way? Why not? Until we stop eating sugar. Until we stop using sugar in our pharmaceuticals until we, use, we stop using sugar anywhere, we will be, that factory will have to be in operation. And we need to go back and ask ourselves, for how long have we imported sugar? Mm. So we are keeping other people's farms and technicians and so on busy. Do, do you, you get my drift? Well, and, we, we have a number of factories. I mean, there are so many others. I know this is just one of the examples, yeah. but talking about the Commander Sugar Factory, the fact that for these many years, we still have this factory not in operation. And that is heartbreaking because, again, we're talking about the importation of sugar, and that's just one aspect of it. But looking at the number of factories that we can generate so much income, a number of employment opportunities for young people, we don't have that in operation. You know, what, what, what so, really is the plan? You see, it is not just factory. I just used that as yeah. an example. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that in a country, if you are able to be become self-sufficient in food, that, that will be a big plus for you. You can also go on to become self-sufficient in clothing. Mm. You can become self-sufficient in housing. After all, the three basic necessities of life we are told is food, clothing, shelter. If you can just do that, imagine the jobs you'll create. And mm. apart from that, there are also shortages of teachers, of nurses, doctors, and so on and so forth. And we've done our analysis to see where the gaps are in terms of the UN recommendations. So all of these areas have to be taken care of. I've just talked about lack of water, mm. lack of electricity in many parts, too many parts of our country, actually. Mm. All of these are areas that we need to pay attention to. You talked about the factory that has stalled. So have many of the schools we're building. And I've said everywhere that, let's say, one hospital has been abandoned. It means the contractor is not working, the foreman is not working, the steel bender, the carpenter, the mason, the painter. All of that. And all of that. These are all jobs. Mm. Okay? And when the hospital is done, the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, the cleaners, the security people, and so on, the food providers, 
Okay, mm -hmm. so so you you see where the argument is coming from. Yeah. The same for a school. Uh, similar for a road, you know, not the same type of workers, but at least, but yeah, similar. Let's go into the area of education, and I know that's at your heart because again, you served as education minister. Now, the current education minister says that during your reign, he would describe it as an embarrassment. You left the sector in heavy debt, and they've had to come and fix it. I mean, they've been more teacher-centered. A number of things that they have said. I'm sure you've heard this over and over again. But what do you make of these comments that are constantly being made about your tenure as an education minister? I don't know about them being constantly mm. made. I don't know the last time those comments were made. They were mm. made when we left. Mm. But there was also a lot of money we left in the ministry. In handing over notes, there are so many things. You can choose whatever you want to pick and share with the public. So that's why I raise the argument. We had the T-Tel. Mm. We had... You know, how, how, was the Eastern, well, how was the Eastern University built if we didn't leave any money? The Eastern University, mm. how, was it, how was it built? So this is money the NDC left, you see, and that's how see, they built the Eastern. this is where Eastern. I also want to respectfully urge that we all do a bit of research. Mm. We could have found out who sourced that money. Then this argument may be, they not even have a But it's not only about building of universities. I mean, they're, they're talking about a number of other things as well. So yes, that's and I'm telling you. you that we also left a lot of money. Mm. And I've used this as an example. Listen, if you leave this company today, it doesn't mean a bill will not come tomorrow. Yeah. Okay? Simply because you've come into power doesn't mean the world has stopped. The world continues. Things come. Others you've paid. Others you haven't been able to pay. Unless you're saying that oh, we did nothing, we didn't even send them to finance, I'm not blaming anyone. Mm -hmm. Or the process, there's a process you go through. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'll leave that argument there. I decided not even to respond because I didn't know where that argument was taking What's us. Coming. But how would you describe your tenure as education minister? All I'll say is that we did the best we could. You did the best you could? The very best we could. Okay. And, and let's talk about free SHS now, because that's also another <laughs> angle of the, edu uh, of the conversation. The NDC says that we're going to extend it to the private sector and include more private institutions. But there's also been the argument that even if it's going to take a year for us to get rid of the double track system, because by that time we would have provided enough um, you know, infrastructure to accommodate the numbers, it still does not necessarily address the issue, because we're still asking the question of where are all those children who might not get the chance uh, to enjoy maybe double track, what's going to happen? To enjoy to double them? track, is that what you're saying? Mm. To enjoy double track, is that enjoyable? Double track. I don't is want not to enjoyable. turn the whole thing mm. into as if I'm interviewing you, but I just want to. Draw. No, don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> I just want to draw that. You know, we are not the only ones saying that we'll get rid of double track. Mm. At least we have shared our strategy, and we are getting response. I don't know. The is other one year strategy. enough to provide infrastructure and all the other aspects of it? Let me explain to... something. Okay. How did this whole thing? begin. I believe you've interviewed the minister. I believe you've interviewed the minister. Yes, for I have So he will tell minister. you mm -hmm. what the whole thing is. Article 25 of our constitution enjoins private participation in education. Mm. So there's private participation at all levels. Actually, the only place where there has not been private participation is the polytechnics and technical universities. And I suppose because it's so cost intensive, or maybe other reasons. So it is not surprising that at the secondary level we have private schools. Mm. So if you are bringing a policy that denies the private schools access to free, to free, uh, free SHS, mm -hmm. I mean, then it means that all the children will move from the private school to the public school. Why wouldn't you have overcrowding? Okay. Why wouldn't you? And if it's the same number of children, 100 children, maybe 20 would have gone to the private, to the private schools, and they are all coming here, you have, I mean, automatically, you'll mm. have overcrowding. And then the private school's premises will be, will be follow. Very simple, I think. Mm. So you want to reverse it. Why are the private schools empty? So you have that. We also were building the e-blocks. They have stalled. So why wouldn't the premises be over, be choked? They will be. Mm. So that is why we need to complete the new buildings. That is why we need to partner, and we need to look at other measures too. For example, the cut-off point. So 
You see, examinations, just that, um, and it's not just us, it's everywhere. Mm. It's a kind of evaluation, but it also allows you to see the strength of the student. That's why you notice that maybe this course is not for this person. Not that he or she is not bright, mm -hmm. but that's not what their flair belongs. So the examination allows you to do that. So the important thing is to be able to diversify the terrain. So that if the person decides that or shows interest in a certain way, you don't force that person into another area mm. because that is what you are calling education. Okay. So you'll notice that was when we paid a lot of attention to TVET. We did the qualifications framework. We did so many things in TVET. And also to rebrand it to make it attractive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that children will have choices, not because they can't do this or because they weren't smart enough. But I think that's bad language. We need to review that. It is just that that's their strength, that's their interest, and we need them, and there's nothing wrong with it. Should we consider cancelling the BC, for example, because uh, the concern has been that it's, it doesn't necessarily uh, portray the intelligence or the interest of children because they are still a little young and we should give them the opportunity to move on to the secondary level and maybe at that time they'll be matured enough. Listen, there are countries that have collapsed all these. But when you are going to the university, then you have a whole set of exams to write. Mm. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Because they are not used to being examined. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we can have that. If, if as a nation, but I would not say it's a good idea. What I'll say is that, you see, measurement and evaluation by itself is a very, very complex area. We have experts. They can advise us. So that we don't just decide, oh, simply because I feel. The feeling is important, but you need to base it on very, very sober facts. Because you make these decisions, you are, you are affecting the country in, in future ways. So you have to be very, very careful with that. We are okay. not the only country that writes exams, mm. okay, at mm -hmm. that age or even earlier. If you decide, for example, that oh, everybody must go up to a certain, to first degree before they are examined, yeah. you must have a solid rationale for that. Why not up to first degree? Okay. You know? So there has to be a reason why you are stopping here or not stopping there. And it must be based on solid research based on your own national needs, your own national projections, where you think the economy should go, where you think life could be. Okay, so mm -hmm. based on, on all those probabilities, you come back and you make your, you, 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 you design and you, you strategize and then you have implementation plans. That should be reviewed okay. constantly because you can decide that, oh, in 40 years' time, A, B, C, D. And then you have COVID, you see. Yeah. Or in 20 years' time, whatever. So you shouldn't be afraid to review, you shouldn't be afraid to look back, to pull back even sometimes, and take another look at what you are doing. And so if we review and we realize that maybe there's a need for us to scrap BC, would you be in favor of that if the review No, no, report... if, the, if. It's mm -hmm. a hypothetical situation. Yeah. So if. If it calls for that, so if there's a need for that, then of course you if will not. If it calls for everybody getting a, a PhD before they get exams. Mm. That's so Why weird. not? Let's talk about um, you, the fact that you're a woman. You're the first woman to be appointed or selected as a running mate in one of the two major political parties in the country. That alone is historical. We've had that in minority parties as well. But this got a lot of people excited. I mean, the celebration was all over the place. But then the other... Uh, side would be that we've seen so much celebration for Professor Nana Jinnapokwajima. We don't see same happening. We have three female presidential candidates and we don't see people celebrating them as much as how we're celebrating Professor Nana Jinnapokwajima. Has that come to your table yet? No, never. Nobody has ever said no, that no, to no, you? No, no. Listen, I've been very busy with my campaign. I've been very, very busy focusing on how we're translating mm. the manifesto into reality. What if, what if, what if, so... Uh, that hasn't come to your table. But how do you feel no. about the support so far? No, I wish everybody would get support. I mean, let me put that out there. Mm. Because I know what it takes to put yourself out there for this kind of scrutiny and so on and so forth. Mm. So I wish they would also get the support. But I have been overwhelmed and I'm very thankful. I'm very, very, very thankful. I'm mm. grateful. 
not only to my children, to family, to friends, but also to my former students. You know, many, many people I taught once upon a time, I didn't know where they were. Yeah. And they're all coming back with all kinds of support. You know, it's been very, very encouraging. And more so when we go into the field. And one scene that always strikes me, you know, it's, it's more or less etched in my mind mm. of an old woman coming with a walking stick mm -hmm. and walking through the crowd. She's refusing to be, you know, to be bullied or to be pushed aside. And she just wants to come and say, God bless you. Wow. It's so touching. It's so, so Are touching. you sometimes surprised by I'm, a, I'm very, very surprised by the reception, by the crowd, but I'm grateful. Mm. Okay, I'm very, very grateful. And people coming to you, telling you their problems again and again. You know, this is what we want you to do. This is what we are asking for. It's, and, I'm, and I keep saying, listen, we're going to do this together. Mm. You know, we are all going to be in it. We are all going to do this together. Absolutely. So your ideas are important. I don't have all the answers. And I'm sure you may have better answers than I do. Yeah. And we'll all dialogue. We'll all walk this path together. How do you feel about America electing its first ever female vice president? So yet to be sworn in, of course. I know that some issues, uh, <laughs> we're not sure what's going to happen in the next couple of days. Um, you know, but just the fact that we have the first ever female vice president, and she has black roots as well as a number of other roots, Asian and all of that. Yeah, I mean, and, and also Native American. Native American. And the fact that you are female, and this could be you, who knows, in the next couple of days as well. Do you draw inspiration from what's happening there? How do you feel about it? No, I feel very happy. Mm. I feel very happy for women of the world. Just like once upon a time we felt happy for the Indira Gandhis and, you know, all the women who've, who've come out mm. to lead their countries or to support the leadership of their country. I feel happy. And as I said in my um, acceptance speech, mm -hmm. it's not so much about you, but it's about what it signifies. And I was very happy to listen to her speech, and she echoed something similar. Yeah. You know, and I said, ah, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives hope. It gives, it shows people that, it shows people not to shut the doors in their own faces too long, I mean too early in their lives, but to recognize that they can soldier on. It doesn't matter where you end up, but just knowing that the possibility is there, mm. it's a big plus. And I want to illustrate again with um, the reasons why we did our technical universities. If, for example, a child in JHS says, I want to be a doctor, he may not end up being a doctor, but that's not the point. Mm. The point is that he wants to study, go far, and achieve something, yeah. which the society, I mean, applauds. But when the child in the same class says, I want to be a carpenter, mm -hmm. then it's like the, the highest you can get to is, to is to have a diploma. Why is that the case? It needn't be that way. Mm. It means that we've already shut the ceiling very low for this child. Yeah. And then we go ahead and import all these things. I'm sure if we were to do an inventory of the things in this room, we'll notice very little has been produced by us. But they've been produced by other people whose children are just as intelligent or not as our own. Mm. Okay, so by lifting that ceiling off that child's head and knowing that, oh, so if I want to become a fashion artist, whatever, I can also go to a university and get a degree. Yeah. That alone, you see, is a sign of success because you've shown that there are possibilities. So coming back to this lady's um, Election. ascension to yeah. this position, it's a message that is sent out to all of us, mm. especially to girls and to women because it just happens that for so many years, you know, we have not been visible in certain places. Places, yes. So when you get one or two people showing that it is possible, it is exciting and should be exciting for all of us. For the fact that it's happened in the U.S., are you, how optimistic are you that we could see a replication of that here in Ghana as well, with you probably becoming the first ever female vice president? As I'm saying, no, it's not so much that it happened there. Or it's happened elsewhere too. Mm. 
you know. But I mean, for Ghana, it would be a first, and it could be you. No, no, maybe I'm not <laughs> answering the question well. Okay. You asked that the fact that it's happening in the U.S., and I'm saying that we have Joyce Banda, mm. we had Ellen Selig Johnson, yeah. we've had all kinds of women on our continent mm -hmm. also ascending to the acceding to the political um, pinnacle. Yeah. So all of these are examples that give us hope. And you know, I was nominated before she was. Yeah. So I was very excited when I heard that, oh, Joe Biden, His Excellency, has also nominated a woman. I didn't know her. Mm. Of course, I wouldn't have known her. Yeah. But just the idea excited me. And I'm very, very happy that she's jumped over the curve and now this is where she is. Let's talk about your friendship with Dr. Joe Biden. <laughs> because I saw that tweet and I was quite curious about it. I mean, for those of you who haven't seen the tweet, so uh, Professor Nana Jinofukwajiman tweeted a day ago saying, congratulations to President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris on their victory in the U.S. election. Special mention also to my friend, Dr. Joe Biden, who will become the first lady of the United States of America. Good wishes for the journey ahead. Okay, I met this lady, I think it was 2016 or 15, when I was invited by the American government to come and give a keynote mm. at the International Literacy Day. And the program was held at the Library of Congress. And I think she chaired one of the panels also. So after the program, we just fell into talking. Mm. She's also in education, I'm in education. And because it's literacy, yeah. I focus on relevant literature for children because this is where you are stimulating the imagination of children. So literature is very important mm. in broadening perspectives and getting people to see what is possible or what should be possible. So I had taken a couple of my own folk tales that I've written for family. Actually, the book is meant for family use. Oh, I see. Not so much for, Not children, for children only yeah. because I had busy parents in mind, like myself. And I was saying that if you can spare five, ten minutes, read a story to a child before he sleeps, mm. that calms the child and, you know, however busy you've been during the day, you've also been there for your child. So she saw the books and she was very curious about them. So we're talking about it. So actually I gave her a set. Mm. So maybe if you can call a friend that way, then that, yeah. that's what it was. So that's what I mean. So that's how we met. But it was a very exciting uh, program, and I was very happy that I've been invited to be part of it. Are we going to see that kind of change? Again, back to that question. Are we going to see that kind of change in Ghana? Do you think that Ghanaians are ready for the change, for the rescue that the NDC is preaching? Ghanaians are ready for the change. Or the rescue? Just look at the campaigns, mm. and I think you'll see something, as I said. Um, there were areas that maybe uh, in times past maybe people couldn't go to or wouldn't get the reception we are getting now. And so these are all indications, I think, that people want that kind of change. They want to feel included. Okay. They want to feel respected. They don't want to feel alienated. They don't want to f be called names that they don't belong or they belong to a national, uh, another nationality, and from highest levels of people in government. And that's all. They, they just want to be. They just want to be and be respected like ordinary people. You know, we cannot say, for example, that we are closing our land borders where people can fly in. Mm. I mean, you know, they, they, they feel they are, they are not being, they're being discriminated against, Ideally, and they are not being respected. Open. You know, whatever it is you need to do, uh, you go to um, the flower bed, uh, border because of the big market in Lome. Mm -hmm. People depend on that on on that um, on that situation for their livelihood. So all these months, what are they doing? How are they selling? Who is buying? Where are they going? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's a real situation that is creating a lot of challenges for people along the border. Mm -hmm. You know, so when they here of inclusion that are. So we are all part of this. It excites them. And I think they have every right to be excited about it. Because fundamentally, human beings are not asking for much. And that's what I'm also noticing. They're not asking for the moon. If they're asking for water, is that such a big deal? You know, is that too much for any human being to ask for? Water. 
So we have free water for, for citizens. As yeah, we have free well. water, but they don't even have water. Mm. You see, that's where the unfairness comes in. We have free water because we are not paying for it. They don't even have it. How about them? Mm. What, what plans do we have for them? Or maybe we should just leave them to be fetching the water by the polluted water or whatever mm. so that some of us can have water for free. And they know and they hear and they know it's not fair. If that's the case, the concern would be that, so what do you bring to the table? I mean, I don't think it's just enough to say that because Professor is a woman and for the fact that we also want to make history, then we should vote for, you know, uh, the NDC to, to, you know, to the presidency. So what do you bring to the table? I've been asked this question before. Mm. And I was, I was asked that question even when I applied to become vice chancellor. Yeah. Oh, so it's not just that, you know, uh, it's a woman mm -hmm. and so on. I bring my experience. I bring my service, my dedication. I bring my record okay. to this position. And that is not a cup of tea. Mm. Okay. So it's not just that you are a woman. Although that is also important, let's not discount that. It is also important because we have not been visible. And because we have not been visible, it's been like, oh, it's not possible. So that possibility also counts because I'm a woman, mm. and I'm proud to be a woman, of course. Mm. And if it gives hope to young girls, I'm very happy. When it gives hope to girls, I'm very happy. Because, you see, we need everybody to build this country. We cannot leave the entire burden to one gender. And I think they ought to have been protesting by now. <laughs> Women should have been protesting by no, now. No, 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 the men should the have men. been protesting. <laughs> because we are leaving too attention. much that we are leaving too much on their hands only when they know very well that we have capabilities that we can bring things to the table and support and move entire country forward. Should women be the ones to take up the mantle or should we have the opportunity provided for them? Same opportunities that go to others to take up the mantle should be given to them. But are women ready? Were the men ever ready? Mm. Were they ever ready? So how ready, you know, what, what was the measurement? For readiness. Yes. But I mean, of course, we all do understand how patriarchal our, our society is and the fact that when a woman tries to ascend, there are a lot of things that come down, an avalanche of, you know, uh, negativity I coming know. to it. And that sort of makes them cower a bit because they're not sure if they can do it. And that's what I'm asking, that are we yes. ready? It, it's, a, it's a valid question. And I agree with you because I've lived it. I've mm. lived it at many levels okay. and in different times, you know, when um, because you are nominated as a woman or you get a position, a professor, whatever, and people just want to find out, oh, is it because she was a woman? How did she get this position? Mm -hmm. And a whole lot of things. But we never ask those questions of men, you know, so somehow we judge the woman differently. Yeah. And I think that there's a whole um, psychological explanation to it. And maybe we'll do it another time. Mm. But the long and the short of it is, it's about perception. Okay. It's about not having seen women here before. L let me tell you a story. I remember when I got my PhD. Mm. And um, we came home after the ceremony. And there was this little boy who was a friend to my son. He was also very little then. And his dad said, you know, Auntie Nana is now a doctor. And this four-year-old boy said, no, she cannot be a doctor. She has to be a nurse. Wow. <laughs> you see? Because he goes to the hospital and the doctors are male. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you blame him? Mm -hmm. That's what he sees. If he had seen enough women doctors, it would have sunk more easily with him. Mm. Okay, so these are some of the, let me say, the realities and the obstacles. So we need to tackle but from the roots. It's all of us. And you see, this is where the possibilities come in. If this child has seen many women doctors, he would never have made that comment. Mm. But he's seen many women nurses. And who says that nurses cannot study to get PhDs? So again, you look at the nursing programs in our country and how far do they get? And who says they cannot get further? Mm. 
Mm. So you see so much work that needs to be done at the level of women because a lot, a huge percentage of the nurses are women. Mm. What is the highest qualifications they have? Says they cannot go higher. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so definitely, yes, you'll be judged harshly, all kinds of comments and so on. And as I said, it's just that we are not used to seeing them. And it's like, we are all in this place. Now you want to jump to that place, you know, wh wh what do you mean? What do you mean, yeah. And sometimes it's, it's, it's personal, it's vicious. Other times I think it is just people not too sure about what it, this is going to be. Mm. And uh, as I said, also being judged harshly. Oh, there's a woman vice chancellor. Okay, let's see what she will do. You have people but we that. never make that comment when there's a male vice chancellor. We've mm. never done that. So it's like immediately there's a male vice chancellor. Okay, we've accepted that we are going to support. Yeah. But the woman comes along, oh, really, let's see. You know, so those comments alone make you realize that, no, sometimes you have to overreach yourself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to work harder. And I've shared many stories with young academics. You know, I said, if you know very well that the number of academic papers you need from point A to point B is five, why don't you make it six? Mm. Yes, everybody else may make it five. But you know certain nuances that may work against you. So work against them. It's not fair, I know. Yeah. And it shouldn't happen that way. But until you are able to bring enough women professors to this decision committee, you may. And I said, I've lived it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you should go through what I went through. So I'm sharing my experience with you yeah. so that you can find a softer landing spot for you. I mean, it's quite obvious that even after you were announced as the running mate, you went through that because the debate again was uh, the vice president, if elected, should be the head of the Economic Affairs Committee. And so uh, you did make a comment about it that, well, if that's what they are saying and you are going to have to debate uh, the current vice president about economics, how about, okay, we debate on literature as well. But there are some people who have come out to say that that's a flawed, you know, uh, Thing to say because we don't use literature to run the economy. Listen, there are people who say all kinds of things, and there are people who find fault. It was just a comment I made, not even in earnest. Mm. I made that comment almost as a joke. Maybe okay. it didn't come out the way it yes. should. Mm. And without going into an argument about what discipline is important and what is not, let me say that those of us in literature, what are they saying that uh, literature doesn't put food on the table. It's not required to run an economy. It's literature. What is literature? Mm. Let's go back to the basis. What is literature? Okay. Literature is uses of the imagination. And you need to imagine everything before it's possible. Flying was imagined before it was possible. Mm. Computers were imagined. When computers were made and they were like four-story buildings, Somebody imagine that you could have a computer that can slip into your wallet. These are the uses of the imagination. You imagine it and then you set to work on it. So literature is very, very important. Mm. And yes, it puts money in the pocket. And yes, I've taken care of myself and I'm a literature person. So it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't a, let's say, a serious invitation to say. I was just sort of making a joke. That was all. But did it upset so you that people were oh, making no, that no, comparison? No, 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 no. Do, it never bothered are, you? Why should it? Why should it bother me? Okay. You don't run any, any discipline down. All disciplines are important. Mm. And literature is important for the economy too, let me say it this way. Okay. Okay? Okay. Yes. Let's talk about the, the <coughs> NDC party. What's the feeling like? 28 days to election. Are you fired up? Are you, I mean, what's it like in the party? Everybody is busy. Mm. Everybody is fired up. We are not taking anything for granted. We are not leaving any stone unturned. We are going all out to win, and that is the agenda. Are you going to accept the election results, even if it doesn't go in the favor of the NDC? Let me say that the NDC has no record of boycotting elections. Mm. The NDC has no record of not congratulating the winner. The NDC has no record of not attending the inauguration of a president. Do we have that record? So why is this question being thrown at us? Mm. We have no such record, okay. unless I haven't read the history properly. 
But we are the ones always being asked whether we'll accept the results or not. What do you think is going wrong? It's because the NDC is saying that they're not sure if the EC is credible enough based what on do the you number think? of things. You are the fourth estate. Please help mm. us. What do you think? I mean, it must, there must be a reason why the NDC We have had that. elections before. You mm. are the journalists. How have we done it? You mm. can come up with the facts and support everybody and explain things. You okay. see? Yes. And that is how we all play our roles to build a strong country. How have we ever registered? Well, when, how was this registration done? How have we gone to verify our, um, our registration? How was this one done? When was the last time if you went in to, to check? Let me use myself as an example. I went to check, and I was told that my number had been given to someone else. Mm. Is this something that happens? So I asked the gentleman, so why am I the one who has to go and change my number and not the other person? Mm -hmm. But I just cut it short because, I mean, there was a problem. There will be challenges with everything. So I went to the uh, district office, and I said, but I'm driving. Do you expect the people in the other villages to go and check and take a vehicle, two, three vehicles, yeah. before they go and check? And when I went to the district office, can you imagine the crowd? Who is going to have the patience for that? Elections is about making things so easy that as many people as possible are, uh, uh, register and are encouraged to vote. Mm. It's not about giving the impression that you are disenfranchising people. And that's the impression that's been created? What do you think? I'm asking you. Oh, no. I mean, see, as a party, I'm asking you no, as a no, party. No, because, no, no, no. I mean, as, me as has, a party. has said, I think about three times that... The party will not accept a flawed elections. But my friend, my friend. I'm your daughter, by the way. My daughter. <laughs> no, that Ghana itself must not accept the results of a flawed election. What if the NDC wins? Would we still say then? Of a flawed election. I'm just saying. Is it flawed now? Mm. You think? Yeah. So you see, it's not that, oh, if I win, then I'll accept. Mm -hmm. And if I lose, then I'll, as I said, we don't have any such record. This process is going on, and people must speak. That's what they feel. And if you, f you think that the feelings being expressed are genuine, you look at the issues. You invite them for a discussion. Why are you talking this way? What do you think the issues are? So that before we get there, if, for example, we are told that 30,000 names have been deleted, mm. who are those people? Am I to travel to my village to vote just to be... And you've given me a car to be told that my name is not in it. Isn't that an invitation to unnecessary disruption? But the EC has addressed these issues. I mean, just this weekend as well, she was in Parliament. So we, we have the list. Well, we still do not have the list, unfortunately. You see, so what, how has the issue been addressed? She gave an update on, on what has been done so far. The fact that there are 95 Do we know the 30,000 people who are not going to vote? Mm. Yes or no? We don't have that. So, so what are we saying? That she's mm. addressed the issue? How? Let's support her to do the right thing. It's also her own reputation on the line. But are we not being too hard on her? I mean, as a woman as well. Again, we'll come up and say that we should support women to get to the top. But once they are there as well, then... You they're... come to say, I've deleted 30,000 names. Mm. So you know the names you've deleted. Is that being too hard? And we know the implications. If people should go to the polls and not find their names there, mm. that is rather protecting her. It is not being harsh on her. Somebody deleted 30,000 names. Very neat number. 30,000, not 30,235. Mm. 30,000. Just show the list. That's all. Okay. I don't think anybody is after her by making that request. Because it will forestall unnecessary conflict, which nobody wants. We want the elections to be peaceful. And you see this, that it might not help with a peaceful election. Because I'm sure to be very personal and allow me to do that. If mm. you went there and you didn't find your name, you're not just going to turn around and say, oh, thank you very much, I'm going home. You're not going to be happy. Mm. And different people will express their emotions differently. So you need to foster, you need to make the process so easy, so transparent, that there will be very few uh, reservations.
that is all we are asking for. And I don't think that's asking for too much. And if these ad uh, reservations are not addressed, let's say a few days to elections, right now we have 28 days, let's say by 20 days or 15 days, we don't have all these issues addressed. Is the NDC going to take a decision? When the time comes, you we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But the MPP also, um, you know, campaigned about corruption in the NDC party in 2016 heavily. And that probably could be one of the reasons why maybe people voted, um, you know, for the NPP. If I ask you to also score the NPP in terms of corruption. Listen, I'm not going to score all our six that mm. we are, we've all seen. If they said NDC people were corrupt, we've been out of power for how long? Where have the trials been? Okay. Mm. Where have the trials taken place? Have they been? Where are the conclusions? What is going on now? Who has been sanctioned for what? What is the conclusion? You see, it's not for one person to say. No. So if you campaign so hard on, on, on any theme, people expect you to live above that kind of reproach. Isn't it? That, mm -hmm. that, that's the expectation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have all these issues running around the Japa, PDS, and so on and so forth. Some of us don't even understand the whole deal because we don't know exactly what's going on there. Okay? Mm. Yeah. Ha! <laughs> We've been speaking to <laughs> Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman. And there's quite a lot that she has touched on today. And we ask that you send in your messages as well with the hashtag election360, hashtag election command center. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, but basically, we're just wrapping up, uh, you know, before we end election360 proper. And I just want to ask the professor, I mean, again, a few days to elections. How prepared are you? I mean, as a person? As a person and, of course as a party to take over? We are very prepared. We have our manifesto, and th that's a guiding mm. uh, document. And the manifesto has become so attractive, it's even been implemented from opposition. That tells you that this document is worth something. Okay? Mm. So th that's number one. Okay. So we are looking for it to come in. Those who thought about it, those who are the, you know, all the discussions that led to that promise, and all the ongoing discussions that we're going to implementing is with us. So we are very ready. We are ready. We expect free and fair elections. Mm. We expect transparency. We don't expect that going forward we don't know whose names have been deleted. We want to ensure everything is open like we've always done. Listen, Ghana, this is not the first time we are going to vote. We've done it so well, others have come to learn from us, they've congratulated us. We want that reputation to remain mm. and even get better. We don't want to backtrack and you know, fall into unnecessary conflicts. That's not going to help anybody. Mm. Okay, so we are prepared to do the right thing. That is why we keep talking about things that we don't understand. And we don't expect that when we do so, we'll be rubbished we expect that when we do so, the comments will be respected and answers will be provided. Mm. That way we are dialoguing. It should be a dialogue, not a monologue. It should that, be a dialogue. Yes. Okay. And, and th that, I think, will bring the tensions down. We don't need to go through this every four years, tensions rising and so on and so forth. Right now, we've voted so many times that mm. you know, we ought to be getting to a level where the tensions are falling rather than rising. I'll let you pledge to peace if you may. Uh, of course, we're all preaching peace ahead of the elections and during and even after. And so if you don't mind, if you can just look into the camera and speak to our people and encourage them to protect the peace. Okay. We enjoy. All I'm saying is that we can all create and sustain peace. And in order for peace to be sustained, we all need to be seen to be fair the rules must be applied evenly. When people feel marginalized, when they don't feel respected, when they don't feel included, then you are creating the grounds for them to behave differently. And most of the time, that behavior may not conform to what you expect. So going forward, it's still not late 
for proper dialogue to take place, to be sustained, and for all of us to realize that violence doesn't build a country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Professor Nana Jane Opokwajima is the running mate um, for the NDC and, of course, ahead of the December 7 elections. She gave us the opportunity to sit down and interact with her. And so keep your messages coming in. Thank you so much, ma'am, for speaking welcome. to us. This is still Election 360. We'll be back to read your messages with Michelle. Keep watching.